I only do about every, once every three to four years. So if you're a visitor here today, uh, you, you just got lucky and uh, you're thinking, oh, is this something he is on about all the time at that church? You can ask everybody else here. You just got very lucky or maybe unlucky is showing up today uh, for the sermon. As a matter of fact, I was, I was talking to one of our church members uh, this week, and I was telling him what I was preaching on. I said, I only do this about every three, three and a half years. And he said, you know, that's exactly right. He said, I've been coming for six years. I've only heard this topic talked about twice. Uh, it, I don't talk about it a lot because it's a topic that is often abused um, by a lot of people in our um, in what is called Christianity. I think a lot of them don't have anything more to do with Christianity than I do with flying a spaceship. But but it, it's abused a lot. It also is something I don't care to talk on a whole lot because it, it makes me feel uncomfortable due to my position here. Uh, but also it's something I don't talk on a lot because generally speaking, this is not something our congregation uh, as a whole needs to hear. But why do I even talk on it at all? Well, because I've been commanded to preach the whole counsel of God. And so that means I can't pick and choose. Uh, I have to feed you what God's Word says uh, because individuals need to hear it. And I would label myself among those individuals that need to hear it. Because the principles that we're going to look at from God's Word today are some principles that if I don't remind myself of, I find myself forgetting. So you're thinking, what in the world is he going to be talking about today? Well, I'm going to be talking about giving, and specifically giving money uh, to, the, to the work of the Lord. So uh, you can see why that makes me a little uncomfortable. But I'm going to stay strictly with what the Scripture says, and specifically what the New Testament epistles or the letters say. So after Jesus went back to heaven... The Holy Spirit established the church. And the part of the Bible that is specifically written to the church, that specifically applies to our age, is what's called the letters or the epistles. They are written to churches, and that's where um, the, the doctrine of how the church is supposed to function comes together. I'm also going to tell you the, uh, the general passages I'm preaching from, because I want you to go home, some homework, and read these out in their entirety. Make sure I'm not... Pulling things out of context. So we're going to be looking at, uh, we won't have time to go through every verse, but just select verses from 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And what is happening in these passages is the Apostle Paul is telling the church at Corinth how to handle offerings. Uh, specifically, an offering that the Apostle Paul is in charge of that he wants to occur for a, an extended period of time at the church. And so in so doing, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle lays down some principles for giving. And I want to stress that word principles, because I'm not today going to give you a formula. And I'm not today going to give you rigid, unflexible commands, because that is not how things work in the New Testament era. Uh, we are free from the law. We have Christian liberty. And the Holy Spirit guides us with principles. Now sometimes we like rigid commands. Like, okay, I've checked that box. And all this, I've matched this formula. But that's not how God calls us to operate in, in this day and age. The day of the Holy Spirit. The day of grace. So we're going to look at some principles about giving. And I hope that as you, as you look at them, the Holy Spirit will apply, you, apply them to your hearts as He does to mine. And he will remind you of some things as he reminds me. So I think this will be helpful to you if you'll, you'll pay attention and follow along and, uh, and we'll get through it together. But I think it'll be a good thing. I believe it can be a life-changing thing for you because it has been for me. So the first principle that the Bible talks about, if we're going to be giving our money at church. And by the way, uh, let me say that what we're talking about here is not a, a one-off kind of thing. I'm talking about regular and systematic giving. Um, but the, the Bible says the first principle is that when we give, we're to give worshipfully. We're supposed to be worshiping God when we give. So 2 Corinthians 9, 5. Now look at this verse. They're going to be on the screen if you don't want to follow along. 
Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you have previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. So if we're coming to church, if we're, we're, we're giving, and it's grudging obligation, then we're violating the scriptural principles. That is not how God wants us to give. He wants us to give with a spirit of generosity. And the Bible gives us two reasons for that spirit of generosity, that spirit of worship. Uh, he goes on to say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 8, 8 and 9, I speak not by commandment. In other words, I'm not telling y'all you have to do this. But I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. So he's talking, this is not an obligation. But this is why I want you to give. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. We've got to remember as we give why we're giving and part of it is gratitude to Jesus Christ. Because he gave everything for us. He left all the riches of heaven and he became dirt poor and ended up dying on the cross with nothing for you and me. And if, if we don't keep that in mind, we can find ourselves grudging when we give. When I look at my bank statement and I see the checks that I write to the church being cashed, I don't rejoice when I look at a bank statement and I see debits on there of any kind. You know, that red thing you're looking on the computer, minus this. It, it always puts me in a bad mood. I like to see the green plus, you know, and all these are things coming into my account. So if I'm not careful, if I don't control my mind, I will see that minus. What, what is this? What is this money here? Oh, Charles, I'm in a bit of church. Okay, yeah, that's a check I wrote. Uh, okay. If I don't remember why I'm giving, it will become grudging obligation. I have to remember, hey, this is the way I'm showing Jesus how much I love him for what he did for me. I, I can't ever pay him back for what he did for me, but I'm just showing him a little bit, hey, I love you. I'm sending him a thank you card. And so... If I don't keep that worshipful attitude, I will turn into a, a grudging person. So one thing is we remember what Jesus did for us. And then there's a second thing we, we need to remember. And this passage in Deuteronomy is not talking about giving, but it's talking about worship. In Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18, uh, Moses is warning the people of Israel that one day they may forget God. And then you will say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant, which He swore to your fathers, as it is this day. The book of Deuteronomy says, we should always worship God for the things we have. We should never fall into the trap of thinking, well, I, I did this. I worked for this. This is what I have done. And... Um, and, and this is all mine. Uh, because if we have that idea, then when it comes to giving, we feel like, well, God, I'm giving you my stuff. Instead of realizing, God, I'm just showing some gratitude for what you've given to me. You say, well, Pastor Brian, I do work hard for that. It is my money. Well, is it? The Bible says God gives us the power to get wealth. I mean, sometimes we think our jobs are real secure. You ever think about one little thing can change. Something can be invented tomorrow and your job becomes obsolete. Or maybe the economy takes a downturn tomorrow and your job decides to lay things off. Or maybe the head of your company is doing something illegal like the head of Enron did a few years ago and, and tomorrow it all comes out and your company just goes completely under. And, and the next thing you know, your income source is dried up. Or maybe you're in some kind of accident and you're no longer able to do the work that you do. And so we've got to remember as we give that we're saying, God, thank you, my company's still up and running, and thank you that I got a paycheck. I know that's not guaranteed. Anything can happen. This is a token of my gratitude that you provided for me and for my family this pay period once again. You know, I, I saw 
how God honors that kind of worship. You know, my parents regularly gave to church for many, many years. And you've got to understand, we, we grew up, you know, below the median average of what people in America make. Our family was not rich, but they regularly gave to the Lord through the years. And God always provided. And my dad was in an industry that is now obsolete. There were inventions that were made that made everything my dad worked on where they're just old relics now. And so the business my dad worked at closed. It went out of business. You know the day it closed? On my dad's 62nd birthday when he was able to draw Social Security. That's the day his business closed. It's like God kept that source there till, okay, now you can draw Social Security, you've got some kind of income stream, and now this is closing. You see, we owe God everything, and so as we give, we're not to do it grudgingly. We're not to say, oh, look at that debit in my checking account. We're to say, Lord, you've done everything for me on the cross. But also, you provided my income. And so we're to worship while we're giving. The second principle that the Bible gives, gives us is we're to practice giving regularly. Um, yeah, every now and then, you know, we might give to something one-off, but there should be a systematic pattern of giving where we give to the Lord on a regular basis. So Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16, 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So he said, hey, every week, this is a regular thing. You look and see, you know, how has God blessed me this week? And you give. And it becomes a regular thing. And you see, giving is like a muscle. Like any other muscle, we've got to exercise it, we've got to exercise it regularly. You know, when I was in the Philippines, a, a basketball challenge happened. I, you know, I've got the Filipinos, they love basketball. They're crazy about basketball. And so the Filipinos challenged the Americans, which was Josh, Chris, and me, to a game of basketball. And, uh, and, and it was quite a disaster, actually, for the Americans. We had to actually recruit a Filipino to our team to be able to compete. But it really started out badly because I had not... I don't think I'd actually even touched a basketball in maybe a couple years. And so the first game we played, I mean, I, like I said last week, I'm not coordinated anyway, but you throw that in without having touched a basketball in two years. I mean, there were air balls going up for me and turnovers. and just It was a disaster. And we got to do the first game. It was so embarrassing, but I had to play another one because I knew I couldn't do any worse. And it just couldn't be. So then, well, the second game, I, I didn't do any worse, but I didn't do any better. It also was a disaster. But by the third game, I actually scored two baskets, got a steal, and maybe did a defensive play here. I don't think I turned the ball over. And we actually won the game. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. We're good. Going out on a high note. I want to go because I can do worse than this. But, but what happened? Well, just play three games. Suddenly, a few things started to come back, what little I had in the past, and, and I got a little bit better. Well, giving is the same way. So, so Paul says, you know, give, give regularly. You know, don't just be some haphazard thing. Now, for me, um, the way I do that is I just set things up with my bank. The church gets a check every week in the mail. Because Sunday morning, my head is going every which direction. I would forget to write out a check. I'd forget to bring it. And then I would forget to put it in the offering if I was here. And it's just all confused. But, but I know that that's just a regular system that's set up. And that's how I do it. So practice giving regularly. Uh, exercise that muscle. The third principle the Bible gives us is give according to your means. We just read that. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, on the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 12 through 15, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now, at this time, your abundance may supply their lack, and their abundance may also supply your lack, that there may be equality, as is written, 
He who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Basically what I'm saying is don't worry about what you can't do. Do what you can. Give according to your needs. I mean, we all think, oh man, you know, I just had a ton of money. I'd give to this and that and the other. Do all these things. But if you don't have a ton of money, you don't have a ton of money. But then give according to your <coughs> needs. Give according to what God has blessed you. If there's no income coming in, then don't feel guilty about not giving. God has not prospered you that week. Or you only know, get paid once a month. Or that's when you give. When, it, when stuff comes in. Um, so don't be stressed. But do give according to your means. So uh, I think that's a helpful thing that the Bible tells us. It's not based on what we don't have. It's on what we do. So then the question I guess that we would have is, well, then how much should I give? Well, the New Testament addresses that as well. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. And this is uh, principle number four. I'll tell you the principle after we look at a few verses. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And then in chapter 8, verse 3, for I bear witness that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. And, and willing to give, as you can read in the context there. And 2 Corinthians 8, 7. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So, in some ways, this almost looks like it contradicts the last verse. The last verse said, last verse said, give according to your means. But this says, they gave according to their means and beyond. It says, bountifully give, generously give, uh, ab abound in this. So, so what is he saying? It seems like there's, there's two different things going. Well, there's like this line, okay? And, and so if you think of exercise, this is a good way to think of this. If you're going to work out, you know, there's, there's two things really that you need to know. One is no pain, no gain. You're like, I'm going to do one push-up a day for the next 20 years. And it's not going to do anything for you. You know, you can probably get through that one push-up a day. It's not going to cause much pain. And it's not going to be any gain. That's according to your ability, but there's no challenge in that. So that's one extreme. But then you can do the other extreme, like our, our worship leader, Chris Burke. He's walking better today, but he's been hobbling around for about the last week and a half. Because what happens with Chris is he likes to run, but life is busy. And so he often does not run. And then, like once every three or four months, he'll get a notion to run. And instead of recognizing, hey, you know, I haven't ran in about three or four months. Maybe you need to kind of take it easy and just do a half mile or something like that. He will literally go out and run eight, eight miles after he hasn't run in months and months. So he did this last year. And then he hobbled around here and he was in all kinds of pain for a long period of time. And then I think Megan got him a treadmill or something, some sort of thing, a couple weeks ago. And he was excited and just jumped on it and ran and ran and ran and ran. And, ran. and now he's hobbling around and everything. I, I told him, so I'm going to use you an illustration. So he went way beyond his means. So if you do that, that does nothing for you in exercise except make you hurt and then you can't exercise anymore. So there's this line. There's this sweet spot where there's just enough pain that you know it's working, but not too much. And then the more you work out, you have to kind of gradually increase that. You want to keep working out. Right at that point, there's some resistance. You get a little tired. It hurts just a little. And that's the point. You do that, and then you stop. I think giving is kind of like that. The Bible doesn't exactly say no pain, no gain. But David had a good principle of the Old Testament. Second Samuel 24, 24. David's going to give an offering to the Lord. And a guy offers to give David the stuff of the offering. And the king said to Aruna, no. But I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. In other words... If it doesn't affect our life at all, if there's no pressure on us at all in our giving, then we're not giving enough. And we're giving so much that it's throwing us into all kinds of 
terrible financial straits, we're probably giving too much. It's like working out. So basically, you, you could say, well, what are you saying, Pastor Brian? Give till it hurts? No. I think actually the better term is give till it feels good. Give till it feels right. You're like, yes. This is just enough that it causes some pain, but it's also not giving way beyond my means and doing what I can do. It's just right at that limit. In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis put it this way. I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comfort, luxuries, amusements, etc. is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. So in other words, it creates some pressure, it creates some pain. We know it's costing us something, but yet it's according to our needs. He's like, well, but, but Pastor Brian, I still don't know. Where is that? Where is that? Please tell me a percentage. Well, here's what I will give you. Galatians 5.18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You see, we are in the age of the Spirit. So how much should you give? You need to talk it over with your Father. Lord, what percentage of my income do you want me to give? I, I'm going to seek you. I'm not under the law, the Old Testament law. I am living in the age of the Spirit. Will you show me and the Lord will, he will show you. He will, he will help you to know. Um, and so I think a, a, a key verse is, uh, and we'll look at this verse on the screen a little bit later, but I want to read it to you now. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. <coughs> So in other words, not because Pastor Brian said, this is the percentage you should get, or somebody told you that. You're to purpose in your heart. But as Christians, how do we purpose in our heart? We seek the Lord, right? We pray. We are led by the Spirit, Galatians said, so we're not under the law. And then God will show us what we're supposed to give, and it will be right at that perfect thing where it's costing us something, and yet it's within our means. And so... So give till it feels good. Right, so I get asked questions all the time. Should I, should I give based on my gross or on my net? Um, Social Security, should I give uh, on my Social Security? Because I already gave on that because I gave on my gross before and I was taken out. People ask all these questions. And my answer is, talk it over with your father. Purpose in your heart. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Do what he tells you to do. Give till it feels good. Well, that leads into the fifth point, uh, number five, and that is trust God while giving. So if we'll continue on, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 uh, says, um, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Then you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, He, God, has dispersed abroad, He has given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now may He, God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, while you are enriched in everything, for all liberality, or because of your generousness, which causes thanksgiving to us to God. Now, what is that passage saying? Well, to summarize, it's saying God will take care of you if you give. God will bless you if you give. Now, this is another reason I get nervous preaching about this, because there are these charlatans and these hucksters and the people who should be in jail that are instead on the television saying, send this money to my ministry and plant a seed. Boy, you're going to... We'll just roll in the dough. This is the best investment scheme you ever came up with. You know, better than the stock market or whatever. 
and they make it all some kind of get rich quick transaction. But the Bible does say God will take care of you if you give in faith. He will meet your needs. He will bless you abundantly. It says in every way. So sometimes it's not monetary. It's other ways. And this is why I have to preach this to you because I'm glad somebody preached it to me. Because I have given regularly my whole life and I've seen this come true. God meets my needs. I've seen it in other people. I was talking about my parents. They regularly gave. We were below the median income. Most of my friends in school, they were their parents made more money than what my parents made. And yet, somehow, my parents retired with no pension or anything like that. They retired debt-free. They were able to buy this farm, which was the desire of my Dad, mom's heart, they always wanted more. They were going to buy this farm. And, uh, and then that was, you know, uh, in the latter years of dad working, that was paid off when they retired. And they were able to send me to college and not take out a loan and pay for it. And my mom has told me, on paper, this never worked. It never worked on paper. Our budget never worked. But somehow it worked. Because God just does something when he is in charge of our finances. I've seen this over and over again with other people. I've seen it in my life, and unfortunately, I've seen it in my life both ways. So, most of my life, I've been very obedient to the Lord. Lord, what percentage do you want me to give? I've done what God says. Um, I'm a budget person. You can ask Maria, every dollar's on this thing. I look at it, it never works. I look at what we're given, and I'm like, oh, I could use that. To, this just doesn't balance out, but somehow it always does. One year, uh, many years ago, our church was in a campaign to pay down our church debt so that we could hire staff to come on full time, where we got Josh and Chris. And uh, I was challenging the church to give what God wanted them to give that year. And we're going to take any surplus our church had and put it towards that debt. And the Lord challenged me to give 40%. And I thought, oh, what is Maria going to say? So I went to her and she's like, if that's what God's telling you to do, then do it. I don't know how this works. But at the end of the year, we had $8,000 more dollars than we started the year with, giving 40% of our income. Now, God only challenged me to do it that one year. But God took care of me. So there is the boy Brian's a hero story. So now let me tell you the Brian's a goat story, okay? Uh, so then, we're going along, we're giving, and uh, giving it the percentage God wants us to give, our, our regular giving percentage. And I'm looking at the budget some time ago, my personal budget, and instead of remembering all these things I should remember from the Bible, maybe because the pastor's not preaching on it very much, and the pastor needs to hear it too, I looked at it and I said, you know, this percentage we're giving, really we should scale it back because it's not working. And actually there is a percentage the Bible required in the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law, you were required to give this certain percentage. We're giving quite a bit in excess of that. I think it would be okay to lower it back to what God required in the law. I mean, after all, that's the law. I'm going to give it to this percentage that the Old Testament said to give instead of this one the Spirit is telling me to do because, hey God, things are a little tight. And so I thought I was doing fine. I'm within the legalistic parameters of Scripture. I'm giving the percentage God commanded the people in the Old Testament to give, but I'm not giving the percentage the Holy Spirit is telling me to give, but that's okay. I've got Bible to back up my position. The Old Testament, and even part of the Gospels, when Jesus is talking, they're still under the Old Testament law. So, I will tell you, from the day that plan was implemented, our finances went to the dogs. We were getting hit with unexpected bills. Money wasn't going for, and, and I spent an extended, extended period of time of months where Maria joked and said, what are you doing? I was just sitting there with a calculator over and over and over, trying to make this work. Our bank account kept getting smaller and smaller. All of a sudden, you know, it's, I'm looking out there and I'm seeing like where the bouncing checks things is getting close. We're cut, we cut, we cut. 
everything, and I'm thinking, what is going on? And I'm wrestling, wrestling, wrestling for probably, I don't know, many months. And then finally, Lughead Brian realizes, you know when all this trouble started? When you said, well, I'm going to give the pursuit of Bible says the Old Testament, instead of consulting God about that, and so I remember looking at it and saying, well, my way is not working out. And then I remembered all the times I did what God said. And so I just bowed my head and I said, okay, Jesus, I'm putting you back in charge of my finances. Because you see, when you're giving the percentage that God tells you to do, that's what you're doing. You're putting Jesus in charge of your finances. When we are disobedient, we're putting ourselves in charge. And I discovered I'm a lousy money manager when I do it Brian Tibbs' way. So I, I walked out of the room and I told him, I said, you know what? I just put God back in charge of our finances. I went into our bank. I raised my giving check back to where it was before when I was giving the percentage God told me to give. And I thought, now this is really not going to work. If God doesn't do something, we're just putting in fifth gear headed towards this wall of bouncing checks, which is about three to four weeks down the road here in my calculations. And once I did that, all of a sudden, I would get bills, and they would say, we lowered your bill because we charged you too much. And that starts happening. Our, uh, our health savings ministry that we're a part of was not going to pay a substantial bill that we had because it didn't fit their guidelines. And we call and say, you know what, we decided to go ahead and pick that up for you. And things like that started happening, and all of a sudden, Instead of us heading towards this wall of bouncing checks, it's like an airplane that started to get lit, and suddenly things started to go. And so I'm telling you this, not because our church is in some dire strait where I'm not going to get paid, because we're doing okay. I'm telling you this for you. There's a short line between our money and our heart. And I think that's why Jesus talks about that more than anything else. And for some of us who are very money conscious, it is difficult to walk by faith and not by sight because we're bad people and it doesn't work. But it does when we put Jesus in charge and when we give what he asks us to give. And so that's why I'm preaching this message to you today because I don't want to stand somewhere down the road and say, Pastor, how come you never told me this? This is how you lived your life. And here I was struggling with all this because I wasn't seeking the Lord. I never prayed about my finances. The next one I will just uh, spend a very brief time on. Exercise care while giving. I think this is important though. 1 Corinthians 16.3, Paul says, And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send the very gift to Jerusalem. In 2 Corinthians 8, 20 and 21, Paul says, Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us, in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Paul said, when this offering gets shipped off to the poor saints of Jerusalem after you've been collecting for all these months, he said, I'm not handling the money. And who you approve is going to carry it, and things are going to be transparent and open, and they're going to be honorable. And so I want you to know that when you give to the Lord, you should exercise care when you're giving. And and I think you can do that here at CIC. Just very quickly, nobody here but our treasurer sees who gives. I have no clue who gives or who gives what. Neither do any of the elders, neither do any of the deacons, neither does anybody other than our treasurer or our assistant treasurer. And they are under orders to never reveal that to anybody. So, no one sees who gives. Number two, our monetary policy here at church is not controlled by me, nor by our elders. Uh, we look over things and approve with oversight, but it's set, the budget is set by the deacons, which are nominated by you, and elected to three-year terms by you, and held accountable by you. They put the budget together, and then they submit the budget to you. At our annual business meeting, it's there, and you have to approve it. It's not something that is controlled. And then the third thing I think is important here is that every month out of the foyer, we put a stack of sheets in the rack there. You're free to take it home where every penny we spend here at CIC is documented. You can see every check is written, to whom it is written, and for how much. So you want to know how much I get paid? Just pick up a paper. You can check it out. You can see. You want to see what things are going to? It's all there. It's all transparent. Paul said, if I'm going to accept an offering on behalf of the Lord, 
I'm not handling it. And people, you appoint are going to handle it, and it's going to be clear and above board. And that's in the word, because I think sometimes Christians have given to ministries who have been murky and dishonest and not forthcoming and not accountable, and money that was given to the Lord was wasted to worldly ends. Well, the last point, and I think it's the one that's perhaps the funniest of all these, is that the Bible wants you to give doing this. Worshiping, yes. Until it feels good, yes. According to your means, yes. Regularly, yes. Trusting God, yes. The Bible says you're to laugh while you're giving. And it's normally kind of quiet during the offering, but there should be some laughter, right? It really says that. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So that each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. The word in the Greek is hilaros, which means hilarious. And it's the picture of somebody that's kind of just lost their mind. They're like, ah, 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 woohoo. They're just throwing it in the plate. You're like, really? Give me? I mean, how often do any of us give that? It's like, oh, Lord, here it goes. I can really use this. We're not like, woohoo. But here's why we should give laughing. Verses 12 through 15 of the same chapter. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men and by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. What is he saying? He's saying that when we give, needs are met. Needs are met. Needs of the people of God are met. And number two, lives are changed. Souls are saved. When little kids come to Awana and they're learning Bible verses. When the youth go to camp and kids are getting saved. When money goes to Malawi or the Philippines or these other places and, and the gospel is shared and people are saved and hungry bellies are filled and orphans are taken care of. God is doing all these things. And so that causes something else that passage said. It causes many thanksgivings to God. So the people that are getting saved, whether it's here in a water, at youth camp, or across the sea, they're like, thank you, Jesus. I'm praising your name because you've saved me. And there's praise that's gone to God that would never have gone to God if someone had not given to the Lord. And then the last thing it says is, prayers abound on your behalf. People start praying for you that would never have been saved or would never have been blessed. And I tell you, I've seen this. I know. There's churches in Malawi and the Philippines that pray for us. And they, they, they're they just thankful to God for us. And they pray for God to help us and bless us. There's people who are saved here that pray the same. And so all this good. And when you start thinking, hey, I'm throwing this in the offering plate, but needs are getting met. Lives are being changed. God is being praised. And I'm getting prayed for. Then we can go, woohoo! I mean, what other thing that you spend your money? You don't get that at Walmart, and you don't get that, you know, going to the movie somewhere. Half the time we spend our money, think, oh, Lord, what is this going for? But here, you know, man, I'm paying my insurance. What are they using it for? Uh, but here, you know, God is doing something amazing. And if God is the beneficiary, you're the beneficiary, they're the beneficiary. And so we should laugh. And I couldn't help, as I was thinking about this, thinking about the Christmas carol, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge, old tightwad, you know, running people off. That were, but when Scrooge had his intercourse with spirits and his life changed, what did he do the next day? He just started giving. And he also started doing something he hadn't done in years. The Christmas carol book ends this way. <clears throat> Some people laugh to see the alteration in him. But he let them laugh. His own heart laughed. And that is quite enough for him. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, he's not interested in your money. This message is not for you at all. Because he does not want you to give anything. He wants you to receive something. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you have never personally come to Jesus and asked Him to save you, to forgive you of your sins, to give you eternal life, He wants to give you that gift. And if you put your trust in Him and you call on the name of the Lord in your heart, if you want to be forgiven, if you want Him to be your Lord and Savior, He will give you the gift of Himself, the gift of salvation. And for you today, it's not about giving. It's about receiving.